Welcome to the second episode of SDR Like the Best. My name is Michael Chang and I'll be the host. I want to introduce my good friend, Jane Ng from San Francisco. We've known each other for a long time and I'm really excited to have her on the show. She's also a short-term rental owner and operator and today will be a really good conversation about her business, how she's built it, some of the challenges, some of the high I look forward to this conversation. Jane, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? It's good. Things are good. It's raining outside. We're probably going through like our 10th storm in California <laughs> this winter. <laughs> right now it's spring actually, but kind of unusual weather for us. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, California is always a good weather. We're here in New York with a kind of crummy weather. Although it was a nice weekend, but yeah, definitely looking forward to to spring and shedding all the the winter gear. But um, yes. So love to dive right in. If you wouldn't mind, just kind of introduce yourself to the audience so they know who you are and maybe talk a little bit about your short-term rental experience and portfolio. Sure. My name is Jane. I live in the Bay Area with my husband and three kids. I have a background in travel and hospitality. I used to work in corporate America for various startups. And then about seven years ago, my oldest daughter was diagnosed with leukemia, and that was the last day of my career, and I became a stay-at-home mom. About three years ago, we started investing in real estate. We started with out-of-state long-term rentals because it was much more affordable than investing in California. And since then, we've pivoted to short-term rentals. Gosh, our first short-term rental was about, we purchased two years ago. So in the past two years, we've purchased three. They're all in California. It's our bread and butter, but we do still have three long-term rentals out-of-state. Fantastic. Look, for everyone that is a lot about California, high, the high prices, high regulations, it's great to hear that you started there. I definitely want to double click on that and talk about the process of buying and operating real short-term rental real estate in California. It's a super interesting topic. Before we dive in, I wanted to, touch, I wanted to talk about what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. I know your husband works there and obviously in the news, we've seen the bank, you know, go into receivership and a lot of the a lot of the impacts there on the employees and i really when we started when my wife and i started this business really and we were working as well but a lot of it was having to building something that we were in more control of a w2 job is stable generally until it's not and you really don't have control of your circumstances you have a boss you have outside circumstances that can impact your situation. And obviously that was an unfortunate thing for everyone that worked there, but you just talk about how, you know, how that's affected your situation and having short-term rentals. Was that helpful? Was it even more stressful to have that given what happened? Yeah. My husband's always had a W-2 and prior to getting into real estate, I, and after I became a stay-at-home mom, I, I guess wasn't, I didn't have an income. And so when all of this happened, it was nice that we had something to fall back to, right? Worst case scenario, let's say he lost his job and couldn't find another job. Then at least we have some revenue coming in from our short-term rental portfolio. Is it enough to feed a family of five? Probably not in the Bay Area, but at least we have something. So it, we had some income coming in. It was a difficult time for our family just because there's a lot of things happening, but March 9th and 10th, when basically a bank that was doing really well for 40 years collapsed overnight, it was hard for me watching my husband go through it because I know how much he loved working there. He loved his coworkers. He loved his clients. There was, it. he truly just loved everything about that job. And knowing that there was nothing he could do to change the outcome. And there was nothing he could do to save the bank. Obviously he's one employee. That was really hard for me to watch because he was pretty heartbroken by everything that happened just because he loved it so much. And it's what we all know, right? Like when you have a W-2, yes, there are certain benefits. For us, the biggest is healthcare because we have a child who's sick. And so that's really important to us. But as you mentioned, you there's only so much control you have, right? And when you own your own business, that doesn't mean you can't fail when you own your own business. You still can fail, but you have a little more control when you are the owner of your business. So there are just a lot of thoughts that went through our mind. Who knows what's going to happen going forward? A part of me wants to recruit him to join me <laughs> and to do this full time. And I have I have brought that up with him and we kind of told about it, but he's going to consider it seriously and just going to consider all his options and we'll see what happens. 
That's great. I'm glad you guys were able to get through that, get through that in a good situation. And obviously having your short-term rentals and your long-term rental portfolio, like kudos to you guys for thinking ahead and building, you know, converting that W-2 income into into cash flowing assets that look, life happens and unexpected stuff happens. So that's the reason why you have savings, the reason why you have multiple sources of income to protect yourself in that in those situations. And it just and now that you say you're recruiting him, I just remember when my wife and I were going through the same situation when she quit her job first to start the short-term rental business. And I don't know about recruited, but I probably like recruit. Yeah, you know, I saw the number, so I, got to, I guess the numbers <laughs> recruited me too. But talking about doing it together and the, the risks of that, how do you think about how do you think about the risks of you guys doing it together? And obviously, as you said, your daughter has specific healthcare needs that insurance is probably super important for you. Like, how do you think about that? Gosh, a really good question. I think we're, he's like you, he's a very numbers guy. And so we'd have to, I think almost we'd have to just go to a whiteboard and do pros and cons of him continuing in this current job or finding another W2. And then if he were to, if we were to work on our own business together, what are the pros and cons and what are the numbers associated with that? I think for me, the biggest thing is time. Right. So during the pandemic, thankfully, he was able to work from home. And even now he's able to work from home on most days. He probably goes into the office once or twice a week. And the days that he's home, it's a lot less stressful for me just because he's available. Right. Like especially with my daughter with special needs. Now, if there's an emergency with her, then he's able to pick up the other kids from school. If I have to take the first one to, to the hospital and he's able to be a little bit more present, he can have lunch with our four year old after preschool and he enjoys being with the family more. And if he wasn't tied to client calls or internal calls, then he has a lot more flexibility to do more stuff with the kids. And I know that's important to him and our kids love it when he's around more. And so I think for me and him, that's the biggest draw is just the flexibility of time with your kids when they are home and just to be able to be a little bit more present. Yeah, so that's the biggest thing. I think it's hard for someone who has always been in a W-2 and is a little bit more risk averse, like he's a lot more risk averse than I am, which is, it's a nice partnership we have because I'm the one that has the crazy ideas and I'm more comfortable taking risks and he's not. And so it, we balance each other out. (laughs) If I had married someone just like me, then we'd be all over the place. And so it's a good balance. And so I trust his judgment and he decides. And he did tell me he was going to think about it seriously, working together. And so we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, no, it's yeah. it's going through that. It's great to work together. It's great. And obviously, you have to learn how to work together as well. Yeah. And six years later, still we're still working on that. I'm sure you'll get a different answer from Liz too. <laughs> <laughs> She'll have her point of view there. But yeah, definitely working together is, working together as a married couple, very different. You have to, and especially coming from an investment banking background, for me, it was like a very kind of direct, top-down type environment. And doesn't take a genius to figure out that does absolutely does not work when you working <laughs> with your spouse. It works for the first five seconds before that gets shut down pretty quickly. But no, no that is something that, that you work through. It's like a work in progress, but it's really powerful, right? Because the nice thing is there's no like operating agreement. There's no, what's your split or what do you mm-hmm. do? It's just like, it all goes into one pot and everyone is really, everyone is committed to that goal. And that really helps because especially in the beginning part, you have three rentals, you have three properties ready. I'm sure you're on more, but in the beginning where you start, there's just a lot of uncertainty and a lot of work that goes into it. And if you feel like your partner's there with you hundred percent, it's help. It's just really helpful. We had this conversation on our, on our mastermind call yesterday too, about people wanting to enter partnerships. Like how does that look like for anyone listening out there? It's very powerful, but also has its, has its considerations as well. Maybe just to can transition the chat a little bit. Tell us, maybe just give the listeners, tell us a little bit more about your real estate portfolio. We have some long terms and short terms. Maybe just talk about that a little bit and how you went from long term to short term. I think a lot of people own long term, more people own long term rentals and short term rentals 
And I think people are thinking about how to make a transition. I'd be great to hear yeah. how you've done that. We started with long term just because it was more affordable out of state. So my very first property was actually in the suburbs outside of New Orleans. It was $50,000, three bed, two bath. I bought it from a wholesaler, so it was cash only. And that's it's a decent amount of cash when this is your first time doing this. We spent 35000 fixing it up, sold it for one fifteen about a year and a half later. So we had three of those similar properties right in the same area. But after two hurricanes, I was no longer interested in investing in that yeah. area. And so we ended up doing a 1031 exchange on all of those properties. Some went to our long-term rentals in Arkansas and some went into our short-term rentals. And so like right away, we saw the power of real estate, right? Like you buy a distressed asset, you fix it up, did the burr, and then we were able to defer the capital gains by um, buying something bigger. And we had a much lower down payment than we would have had otherwise. And so the the switch to short term rental came during the pandemic, I was really into listening to every bigger pockets podcast, like every real estate podcast. And it was like the hot topic, right? Everybody was talking about it, because all of a sudden, there's a surge in demand with people traveling. And when people first started traveling during the pandemic, they were still a little weary of staying in a hotel, right? You don't want to share an elevator in a hallway with people you don't know, even if you're masking and hand sanitizing, it was still considered risky. And so people prefer to stay in a house or an apartment with just the people that they know. And so the demand for short term rentals skyrocketed as you because you're already an owner operator by then. And so it was always in the back of my mind. And then I ended up picking the city that we're in by accident because we're in the Bay Area. My brother and his wife were in LA and we wanted to meet somewhere in the middle for spring break. And that's Central California, which is pretty big. And so as I was looking for Airbnbs, I couldn't really find one that we liked or one that looked nice. And so what I realized was in that area, there just weren't a lot of professional operators, right? A lot of mom and pops, a lot of people just renting out their ADU with pictures from their iPhone. So I felt like there was an opportunity for me because if I were to enter the market, I would actually treat it like a business. So from there, I just I made a list of every city in that county, I either went on their website, or I called to figure out what the vacation rental regulations were. And I narrowed it down to two or three, I scoured Zillow. And we were actually in contract within a week. It happened very quickly. All three of our properties in California, we got into contract without seeing them. So even if technically we're local, I mean, one's an hour away, the other two or three and a half hours away. I'm a busy mom, so I can't always drive there to see, go to every open house and see every house I'm interested in. And so my realtor will FaceTime us when she's there. And then she'll do a video walkthrough and she'll send that to us. And from that information, we'll make a decision whether or not to put in an offer. And then when we're in contract, that's when we would go meet the inspector there. If I need something fixed, I meet the general contractor there. I would say all three times when my husband and I actually saw the house, we were a little bit surprised because we're like, oh, it actually looks better in the pictures and in the video than it does in real life. So we're a little bit concerned, (laughs) especially with the first one, like the look on my husband's face when we drove up the driveway and he was not happy (laughs) he said what did we just buy but we turned all of them into beautiful short-term rentals they're all doing really well and I think after the success of the first one he was much more comfortable with the second and the third I don't even think he saw the third one with me he just saw the pictures and he's like it's fine but that first one is always a little bit challenging right because in general short-term rentals I think have a if you're purchasing and not doing arbitrage then they have a slightly higher purchase price, right? Because you either want to buy something turnkey or something you can put on the market right away, or maybe you want a larger home. And so it's more of an investment. But if you buy correctly, especially the first one, then I think the ones after that become a little bit easier. Yeah, no, and and the right timing too, right? Anyone that bought in 2021 with the equity appreciation that's happened since those is really helpful and the cash flows has been such a great investment in the last few years. And they would talk more about that too, like how, just how well it's done. And also like looking forward for people that are interested in pursuing some real strategy, but maybe some numbers here, right? So on this podcast, we're like giving some numbers. Yeah. So maybe talk about just the first year, the first, what, is, what was the purchase price? What did you put in that? What did you put in for down payment and any renovations, furniture and whatnot? And how did it do, how did it do for the first year? How did it do for the first year? The first property we purchased for 722. It's a four bed, three bath. It has a pool and a spa. And it's 
in the summer, it gets really hot. So the pool was key. It's the city in and of itself is not a city people will search for, but it's about 10 minutes from Paso Robles, which is a wine country region in Central California. And so with the pool, there's definitely an attraction. And then the hot, it's, a, it's an in-ground hot tub. So it's not like mm. those Costco ones that you buy. It's in-ground and it's pretty big. It's actually about eight feet by eight feet. So it can comfortably fit like oh, wow, 12 adults big. in there. Yeah. Yes, it's a big hot tub. And so those two amenities it was a huge draw. So purchase price, seven twenty two. dollars It needed a pretty extensive renovation. We essentially bought it from grandparents. And so it looked like your grandma's house. Everything was brown or orange. Yes. And there were probably four different types of carpets in there. And so we just, uh-huh. we renovated everything. And there were a few, like a few plumbing surprises. We had to redo some of, actually quite a bit of plumbing. And so it, all in, including furnishing, some pool updates that we had to do was probably between 80 to 100,000. So let's just round up, say it was 100. So we're all in 822. The first year we grossed 156,000. So it did pretty well. And we put in a 10% down payment as a second home loan. And we do visit that my, my kids love. And because it's a four bedroom, we actually dedicated one of the bedrooms to be like a kid's room. So it has bunk beds. We brought their toys and their books from home. (laughs) And so when they go to that house, they feel like they're at home because it's their old stuff in there. That's awesome. Uh, Yeah. So our our first one's done pretty well. That's really, that's that's great. So you're in for, so is it 722? So closing, let's just say 75 in plus a hundred. So you're in for 175, 156 the first year, typical margin. You're almost cat. It's a two years. You're almost, you're close to being, it's close to being a burr, right? Or as I think the new term yeah. is stir. It's supposed to be being a stir. <laughs> so the burr for people who don't know is jading or refreshing. I'm not as, I'm not as facile with my bigger poly, my bigger pockets <laughs> acronyms, but it's like, um, rehab. Go, you, you do it. Buy, rehab. It's buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and then repeat. Exactly. And yeah. then stir is short-term rental. <laughs> short-term yes. rental, that, that, that burr, without yes. having to do any of that. Generally, you don't have, sometimes you don't have to do the renovations, but it's great. Like you, you've been able to, so that's great. So you bought a property that was, you know, outdated, right? Put real money in 100K, you updated it. So the ARV is going to be higher and just on without the equity appreciate, without the price, general price appreciation, that property has gone, gone up in value to give the investment in there. And then you've had the, and you've had the appreciation just because everything has gone up in price in the last 24 months. You've gotten 150 of revenue during that first year. And then you've been offering two years now with some typical profit margins or you're pretty close to being out. And you have a beautiful 900, that million, 900 to $1.1 million property there. That's, that's generating some really good cash flow for you. So for everyone, like that is the, like, that is like a textbook example of a well executed short term rental property, right? You buy well in the right area. You do the work beforehand for the regulation. So you know that it is a safe investment, right? You identify amenities there that you know are going to attract people. And then that four bedroom count, I think attracts fa- is perfect for families, pool, hot tub, and, and you, and the results, show, the results speak for themselves, 100, 150 plus the first year, I'm guessing probably somewhere similar to second year. And things are probably a little slower this year, but it's at 10% down. You can make a lot of mistakes and still be cash flowing. Yeah. Uh, and also, and so look, I think from an operating perspective, that's perfect. But let's talk about the tax advantages. I love talking about taxes. As your husband is a, you know, still W-2, potentially continuing a W-2 path, high taxes, there's not a lot of opportunity to lower that tax liability with expenses versus a business. So maybe talk more about how you've been able to combine those two together, specifically using buying houses and using depreciation to to that W-2 income. Yeah. So this past year in 2022, we did four cost segregation studies, all three of our short-term rentals. And then we did one long-term rental. The long-term rental, the purchase price was like 180. So it wasn't anything crazy, but we ran the numbers with our CPA and she thought it was still worth it to to do a cost six. So we did. And the amount we were able to lower our um, combined income was about $500,000. And so basically with cost seg, you, you are able to bonus depreciation, a large amount of your purchase price. So typically properties you would do a straight line depreciation of either 27 and a half years or 39 years, depending on the type of property it is. I think most people say short-term rentals is 39 years, but with cost segregation, you can typically write off like 20 to 30% of the purchase price in that first year with bonus depreciation. So it's 
very advantageous. And the great thing is if you're married and one of you has real estate professional status, then you can, after you lower your real estate income tax liability by however much you save with COSIG, whatever's left over, you can lower the W-2 income by that amount. Real life example for us, we made roughly $300,000 in real estate income last year. So with our 500000 that we saved with COSIG, we're not paying any taxes on our rental income. But the additional $200,000 is now lowering my husband's W-2 tax liability by that amount, which also lowers his tax bracket. Yep. I think almost by two levels. And so it's quite a it's quite an aggressive strategy. It's amazing. If you actually run the numbers, it's a pretty powerful tax strategy. And this, I believe in 2023, now bonus depreciation is only 80%. Um, exactly. Last year was 100. But who knows? I feel like this has been around for a while. So maybe it'll go back up to 100 eventually, but it's going down by 20% each year going forward. Yeah. Yeah, it's, that, I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're going to talk to that in, in its very important steps. You're not only able to shield all of the rental income that you're earning from your short-term rentals, right? You're also able to take the excess of that and apply that to your husband's income, or your if you're filing jointly, your partner's income. And not only you're not just lowering his tax bracket by two by two two brackets. If you weren't able to shield your that 300k, you would I guess depending right. on your situation, you could be even higher. It could be even a higher tax bracket. So it's just it's a ton of tax savings. And also for folks out there, short term rental income almost always is not it is considered a passive activity. So you're not paying self-employment tax on there as well. So generally when you're working, you're paying the 15.3% if you're, if you're a U.S. taxpayer for your Social Security, Medicare, et cetera. You don't pay that with short-term rentals if you don't. If you, there are some basic rules that you have to follow, but that's another 15%, 15.3% that you're saving. So this is just extremely powerful. And if you are listening and you have a partner that is a w, high wage W-2 earner, really encourage you to take a deeper look into the strategy because the, at least the way I think about it is when you buy a short-term rental and you have, you're able to take the, you're, you have the, it's not, technically not real estate professional status, but you have, you qualify for the passive acti- the non-passive activity, the non-active pa- activity rules, not to get super technical, but it's basically an interest-free loan to buy your next property. Like that's yeah. the kind of way I think about it. It's like you buy something for half a million, you get 25% of that back. Just make the math easy. Or I mean, let's make the math easy. So say it's an $800,000 house, you get 25% back, 25% of it written off, it's $200,000. And then tax rate you're in, that's, what is it? 30, 35% of 200, 70K-ish, right? Say so 70K. That's a down payment on a house. That was your $70,000 your $70, payment on your first place. And that's, basically a loan from the government that has no interest, that's unsecured, no collateral, and in basically an indefinite term. You, you never have to pay it back until you sell the house. Just the tax part of this is underappreciated, but once you figure it out, you get a good CPA, it really can can, can, can accelerate your path to financial freedom, which is like what we're all, what we're all hoping for. So let's talk about in 2023, you have the three properties. Are you still looking to buy? We are. I think especially after we saw the power of cost segregation for last year. It's we, beautiful. It's a beautiful thing, right? It, this it is. This time of year. It's yes. a beautiful thing. Um, yeah. And it, it forces you to buy every year. Like we were talking about this offline, but we don't have a number of properties you want to buy or like a dollar amount we want to buy, but we know that we want to buy. And obviously the more expensive the property is, like the bigger tax savings you get. And we are continuing to look like we're looking at the areas that we currently operate in. Obviously with the higher interest rates, it's the cash on cash is not nearly as favorable as it used to be. And so we're having to look a little bit outside of where we're typically looking. And yeah, we are still looking. So I we don't really set annual goals in terms of number of properties or what's our revenue goal. But I would comfortably say at the very least, we want to buy at least one more, if not two. But right now, it's just me. I don't have a team yet. I do everything. And when my husband's available, then he helps me. He's my on-call handyman and furniture builder. <laughs> Obviously, as we scale, that's eventually something we have to hire out. Yeah, I think it with the power of COSEG, we, I think we'll always buy every year. We have to buy. <laughs> you have to buy, yeah. It's too good to pass up, especially even if it's not 100% anymore, but 80% or 60% next year, it's still going to be, it's still super advantageous 
especially if you're profitable, right? And it's just the way that we think about it is we'll project out what we think profitability is for our arbitrage. So we have 26 properties, 20 in Philadelphia that we, that's our arbitrage portfolio that's growing and we own six in Tennessee. And we've actually cost-sect everything in Tennessee, so we don't have any, the well is dry there, so we need to buy more as well. But what we'll do is we'll just project out what we think our taxable income will be for the year. We'll haircut it a little bit, just to be a little more conservative, and then we'll buy based on that. We're like, okay, if we have <clears throat> this a round number, we have $100,000 of profit, then we know we'll need to buy four hundred, like a $400,000 property, right? 400000 times 25% is 100000 mm-hmm. So that's the math that we do. But it's just a guide, right? We don't want to be forced. If it's not a good investment, we're not going to buy just for tax reasons, but it definitely helps your cash on cash because you get, you're going to be able to save a ton of taxes that year one. And on that, it's double clicking on that a little bit more. Taking a step back and just being like, how po- I think you're, you probably paid taxes in 2021 and now you're not paying 2022. And it's just like a huge difference of when it comes to April 15th. We've been doing it for a while. So just it's a little less, what's the right word? Um, the contrast isn't as big now, but like, oh, okay, we should be doing it. But I would just say that it's hard. If you haven't done it before, it's a little harder. It's a little hard to believe. You got to find the right CPA that really understands this. So definitely do the research, find a CPA that's comfortable with real estate, specifically short-term rentals and educate yourself as well, because the more podcasts you listen to, the more research you do, you're able to drive that conversation with the CPA. I know for me, it was the beginning. I fired my old CPA because they just didn't understand any of this stuff. And I had to like look around for a new person that's that really understand understood the rules. That's great. I'm glad to hear that things are that you're continuing to buy. So as we wind down the conversation, you talk about scaling your operations and you're doing everything yourself. What are some, what are some challenges that you're running up to now? Like since you have the three short term rentals and now you're looking for the fourth or fifth this year. My biggest challenge right now is just clearing up head with a lot of the Airbnb communications and maintenance requests. It doesn't take a lot of time, right? So if I were to if I were to average the number of hours I spend on this business in a week, it's probably three to five hours, right? It's not that much with communications and talking to your cleaners and all that stuff, but you're constantly thinking about it and it takes up a lot of headspace, which makes it difficult to spend hours and hours focusing on something else. And so I'm got a point where it's a little bit difficult for me to scale doing everything myself. And so I'm looking for VAs to take over different aspects of the business so that I can focus on property acquisition. I can focus on if we want to go into co-hosting, if we want to build out like different aspects of, of the business, like things that generate more revenue. So I'm spending the next couple of weeks just focusing on that so I can, you say this a lot, it's don't work in your business, you work on your business. And that's really resonated with me. And I have been working in my business the past three years. And so now I need to take a step back and work on my business. Yeah, it's it's definitely not the easiest thing to like. There's always the work involved to find a person, train the person to do it. But also there's that psychologically, like just letting go of the reins and trusting yeah. someone else to do it. It does take time, but I will 100% stand behind that statement of working on the business, not in the business. Because once you make that transition, you're, that, that headspace, exactly, that headspace really opens up. And you're just able to focus on higher level things. As you're saying, you want to grow the business to, to more co-hosting, buying more properties. It's going to allow you to do that, really get that scale in your business. Hopefully convince your husband to jump. He's a numbers guy. So the more, it sounds, it sounds like similarly, the higher P&L you can show, the stronger your argument will be to recruit unpaid labor. Hold on, that's kind of how I feel. Like when Liz recruited me, I'm like, hey, I haven't got a paycheck in like three years. I worked so hard. I, I haven't gotten, she hasn't paid me yet. I, I kid, of course, but... Now, and I think it really is like working with your spouse, especially if you already have a business that's going, that's successful, and you drop into the person that is completely aligned with you, that has a complementary skill set, it really can accelerate your business process, your business path. So as we end this conversation, this has been great. There's a question I always ask, and I think I asked you this before. Look, this is obviously, like, short-term rentals is like anything else, it's a team sport. And I wouldn't be here without all the people that have helped me along the way and been kind to me. Similarly for you, what was something that someone... What's something, what's the kindest thing that someone's done for you as you embarked on this short-term rental journey? You did ask me this question before and I am not prepared to answer. (laughs) I didn't think about it, but it's a really good question because you meet so many people in along this journey. And I think it's important to, to be thankful for those who have helped you along the journey. And I'm going to give you the same answer I gave last time, which is my plumber. So with our first short-term rental, as I, I mentioned before, we had some pretty unexpected plumbing issues and 
he made a lot of money from us because there were a lot of things that had to be fixed. And he was always very kind about it. I never felt like he was overcharging me. And uh, we've become friends. He's also friends with my husband. And now I just text him when I have little issues and he just drives by our short term rentals. He'll fix it up for me. He won't charge. Of course, if it's a big leak or something, he'll charge me. This winter, when we had all these storms in California, he texted me and he said, is anyone at your short-term rentals? And I said, no, it's empty right now. It's like a Wednesday. It's empty. And he said, okay, I'm going to drive by. Can you give me access to the inside of your house? I want to make sure nothing's flooding inside. And I can see him in my ring cameras, like looking around the front and backyard, going inside, and then he'll send me pictures. He'll text me. He'll say, everything's fine. He didn't have to do that, but he he's a great guy. And in some of these markets. I think people are thankful that you're bringing tourism into their town and there's different people coming in. And I think that's part of it for him as well. So yeah, I would say it's my first plumber. That's great. Having someone there on the ground, especially if you're managing remotely is critical. So it's great you developed that relationship with him. And hopefully as you're growing your business, you'll find more of these kind plumbers out there yeah. that, that can help you grow. I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing your story. And Best of luck in, tw in 2023. I'm Thank you. Exciting, exciting things to come. Yeah. So Thank you. Cool.